Hey fam. So, I recently played a couple of games that were basically nothing alike, but shared a common element. Bad endings so terrible that they retroactively ruined good experiences. So, I wanted to talk about that a little. This video will contain massive endgame spoilers for Soul Hackers 2, Bayonetta 3, and a little something from Bayonetta Origins at the very end. If you're planning to play any of them, I'd suggest you come back to this at a later time. For what it's worth, I happen to really enjoy Bayonetta 3, and I 1 million percent loved and recommend Cereza and the Lost Demon, but I'm going to talk about its epilogue as it relates to Bayonetta 3's infamously terrible finale. Now, to clarify, when I talk about bad endings, I'm not referring to sad endings, or the Villain 1 endings. There are plenty of solid endings across all media which don't feature tidy little ribbon-tied happily ever afters. Avengers Infinity War was setting up for a second chapter, and even Ralph Breaks the Internet had what I'd call a sobering ending, where the protagonist ends the story in a less happy place than the one he began in, but still experienced an arc and grew as a person, and isn't, like, dead miserable. Or, you know, dead. So when I played two games that I had been massively looking forward to almost back to back, I was extremely deflated when both of them managed to present me with actually bad endings, by which I mean both poorly written and deeply unsatisfying. To start with, let's look at Soul Hackers 2. I've become a massive SMT fan in recent years. I was very late to the party, but it's low-key kind of become one of my new favorite game franchises, period. I have a couple of videos I want to make eventually pertaining to this, but right now I'm just going to talk about Soul Hackers 2 for the purposes of this video. When this game's reveal trailer first dropped, my hype was unreal. It was literally my most anticipated game of 2022, more than even games like Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and Bayonetta 3. You know, much more high profile and hotly anticipated titles in the gaming mainstream. Unfortunately, Soul Hackers 2 was not everything I wanted it to be. Not even close. There's very little I can say about it that hasn't already been beaten to death on this platform, but suffice it to say that despite having an extremely likable and charismatic core cast, the story itself is very underbaked and poorly paced, a problem which is exacerbated exponentially by the Soul Matrix. And I bring up the Soul Matrix here despite this not being a general review of Soul Hackers 2 because it ties directly into the game's ending. And this is where Soul Hackers 2 dropped the ball hardest, in my opinion. You see, Soul Hackers 2 has two possible endings, a good one and a bad one. That sounds fine, right? Pretty standard. And it would seem to put it above Bayonetta 3's wildly terrible finale right out of the gate. But here's the thing. I titled this video The Terrible Power of Bad Endings for a reason, and that reason is because under the right circumstances, even the mere presence of a bad ending can become retroactively detrimental to the player's experience. In Soul Hackers 2, there is only one factor that determines which ending you get, whether or not you completed all three soul matrices for all three non-Ringo party members. For anyone who doesn't know, that is a gargantuan ask for any player. The Soul Matrix is insufferably bland and mind-numbingly boring. There's no twist to the usual combat, the music sucks, and the visuals are exactly the same for every character and every floor. Combine that with Ringo's pre-patch run speed and holy cow, do we have a recipe for disaster here. What's worse though, is that even if a player is willing to put in the time and effort to completing it, progression is still gated behind your character's soul level. In order to reach the finale of each matrix, you need 100 soul points for the corresponding character. While this is possible to obtain in a first playthrough, it's a very tight squeeze that requires completion of a few specific side quests as well. Non-denoted, bland, bog-standard side quests in a sea of other bland, bog-standard side quests, squeezed in between soul-crushing, overly long visits to the already pseudo-optional Soul Matrix. Now, I like to play my games blind as much as possible. I'll sometimes look up a guide on a specific power-up or collectible if I want that specific thing, but I don't enjoy referring to guides constantly while playing my games. It's annoying and it breaks flow. I also didn't realize that Soul Hackers 2 even had a bad ending. 
I actually did attempt to do the entire Soul Matrix simply to obtain new demons, fight new bosses, continue to power up my characters, and witness all the vision quests, because despite all my complaints right now, I was having an okay time while I was actually playing through it. I would just put on other music or podcasts while doing Soul Matrix portions, but I was okay with that, despite their abysmal effect on the narrative's pacing. Unfortunately, I was playing blind, as I think any well-designed game should be built for a player to do, and so I didn't engage with any of the extraneous side quests because I didn't know I would need to get extra soul level from them. All the time I might have put into them went into the Soul Matrix, and I just didn't have the desire or the patience to do any other extra work, especially with the Matrix putting bloated pauses on my story progression at regular intervals. What this ultimately resulted in was me reaching the very bottom of the Soul Matrix for all three characters, but only having 100 soul for one of them. So despite putting in all the work, despite slogging through four entire massive floors per character, going through three two-way teleporter mazes and three one-way teleporter mazes, I was only allowed to actually fight one of the three corresponding final bosses, and thus officially finish one of the three matrices. All the work, none of the payoff. At the time, however, I didn't really care. Again, I had no idea about the game's two endings and how the Matrix tied into them. I was just like, whatever, I'll watch the other two characters' final vision quests online later, no big deal, and I proceeded to the game's finale. I enjoyed the little twists and the fight well enough. Nothing spectacular, and I have plenty of critiques for the game's story that I won't go into here, but the final boss itself was fine. And then the ending kicked in. Oh boy. For anyone who doesn't know, or doesn't remember, here is the bad ending of Soul Hackers 2 in a nutshell. Fig dies, and as a result, Ringo gets super depressed and pushes all her friends away, and is just a super out-of-character bitch in general. And that's it. You save the world, but Ringo becomes a cold, closed-off loner who pushes all her friends away. Fuck you. You didn't finish the Soul Matrix. It doesn't matter if you put in literally 99% of the fucking time and effort, you didn't get 100 soul on all three characters, so eat shit. I was absolutely floored by this ending. But here's the worst part. I looked up the good ending online afterward. Not only is it much more satisfying, but also much more tonally in line with the rest of the game. Ringo remains in character and close to her friends, and yet the only significant difference in terms of why things play out this way is that instead of standing there like an idiot and watching Fig die after the final battle, Ringo runs forward and saves her life with a soul hack. But that outcome has absolutely nothing to do with completing the stupid fucking soul matrix! What is the connection here? What, because I got Ringo slightly closer to her companions, it occurred to her to run forward a few feet and do the things she's already done constantly throughout the game's story? And because I completed three soul matrices, she does this to a character who doesn't even have a soul matrix? What?! So in the end, while I already wasn't exactly chomping at the bit to replay this game, the ending I got on my television screen with my controller in hand was such a slap in the face, so disrespectful of my time, such a massive fuck you right at the very end, after already pushing it with that Soul Matrix nonsense, that it completely annihilated any goodwill Soul Hackers 2 had built up with me. My general enjoyment while playing through it was probably like an 8 out of 10, but my feelings about it at the end were closer to a 3, and it was all thanks to the terrible power of that bad ending. I will never touch that game ever again, even though it absolutely has elements that I really liked, even if I didn't talk about them here. Now, let's juxtapose Soul Hackers 2's situation with that of Bayonetta 3. Again, there's already been a plethora of online discourse about what exactly is wrong with the ending, and oh boy, is there a lot to unpack there. But I want to talk about the detrimental effect it has retroactively on the overall experience. Bayonetta 3 is a profoundly strange game in a lot of ways. For reference, I'm actually not a giant Bayonetta 1 and 2 stan. In fact, I'm really not a franchise fan in general. Honestly, the first two games didn't click with me at all back when they first launched, but a lot of that came down to personal taste. I'm not really a fan of the flashy character action genre. I, I don't like getting a report card at the end of every battle. That takes me out of the experience. 
But despite Bayonetta 3 still having a lot of the elements that didn't really jive with me in the first two entries, it distinctly feels like a Bayonetta game that was designed specifically for me to enjoy. And that's what's so weird about it. I almost feel guilty enjoying it as much as I do, because even on my first playthrough, as I was falling in love with it and remained blissfully unaware of the ending that was coming, I could tell that many of the things I loved about it would be a huge turnoff for the people who really liked the first two entries. I love Demon Slave, I love Demon Masquerade, and don't care at all that it streamlined the weapon system. I even love the constant set pieces and the occasional Jean and Viola chapters. But I love these aspects of the game because I'm not a Bayonetta purist. I like the variety, I like the feeling of bombastic adventure, and I like that for the first time, Bayonetta actually feels like a witch and not just a martial artist with guns strapped onto her limbs. Again, none of these things are objectively better or worse, they're just more to my taste. And like, I don't know, maybe the combo meta or whatever is worse, I don't know, but I don't really give a shit about that. That's not the stuff I'm into. But that's also exactly why I said I feel almost guilty enjoying Bayonetta 3 as much as I do. It has legitimately become not only one of my favorite games on the Switch, but easily my favorite action game of all time. And it's entirely because Kamiya essentially said fuck you to the real fans and just made a game for me for some reason. And the funny thing is, I actually enjoy playing this game so much that the ending couldn't even completely ruin the experience for me. But man, did it deflate the hell out of it. I enjoy replaying this game in a way I've quite possibly never experienced with any other game, but the finale is so genuinely mean-spirited and cringe-inducing and just generally painful to sit through that I basically just have to skip the cutscene every time I reach the end. It's so weird. I can rewatch everything else to re-experience the adventure at large, but I have to just turn it off before the final scene plays because it's that terrible. And that's also something I've never experienced with any other game, or any other piece of media for that matter. Now, don't get the wrong idea. The bulk of the story is no masterpiece either, but I can at least sit through it and get caught up in the flashy set pieces and high-energy fight choreography. And I could rip apart every single facet of the writing in the game in excruciating detail, but again, many, many others on this platform have already done just that, so I don't feel like it would add to the conversation at this point. Kamiya should know what he did wrong by now, and aspiring writers and game designers should know too. But I think it's important to note that while I am still able to replay and enjoy this game, despite some very large caveats, most players had the exact same reaction to the ending that I had to the one in Soul Hackers 2. Bayonetta 3 is overall a much better game than Soul Hackers 2. I think even its detractors would admit to that, but that ending is so unimaginably unsatisfying, poorly written, and guilty of character assassination of the highest order that it managed to retroactively recolor the entire experience in a negative light for 99% of the fanbase. And let that be a lesson to everyone who creates fiction of any kind. This shit cannot be allowed to keep happening. A sufficiently terrible ending can genuinely ruin an entire, otherwise stellar product. Do not underestimate the terrible power of bad endings. Hey guys, I'm adding a little addendum here. I wanted to talk very briefly about the post-credits unlock of Bayonetta Origins, known as Jean's Tale. I couldn't figure out how to segue into it organically in the main body of the video, but I don't really have enough to say about it to warrant its own video, so I'm sticking it here. Kind of fits thematically, though. Jean's tale is accessed through the extras menu, after all. Anyway, I really like and appreciate that the devs added a little something to tie directly into the mainline games, but narratively it largely ended up just deflating me all over again. First of all, it's the only piece of content in the game to contain an overt narrative inconsistency. I know, leave it to the game's sole Bayonetta 3 tie-in to have the worst writing. Basically, almost every single detail of its context and presentation indicates that it takes place sometime between the destruction of the Flame Core and the main game's finale, since Cheshire has all four powers, Cereza's hair has been cut but is not yet in the Bayonetta 1 beehive, 
Cheshire is acting like a total tsundere, and obtaining a portal back to Inferno is still his primary motivation. Cereza's very first line of dialogue, however, implies that it takes place after the finale, as she is disoriented to the mere fact that she's in the Avalon Forest to begin with, and questions why she is quote-unquote back there. Additionally, much like Bayonetta 3's finale, there were so many moments where the narrative looked like it was going in a more exciting and uplifting direction, only to end up running past the finish line and into the garbage dump behind it. Jeanne is my favorite character in this franchise. She's literally the only character I ever play as in Tag Climax or Bayonetta 3's Witch Trials. I started getting very excited when Singularity directly referenced her death in 3, and we were even presented with artwork of the moment in Origin's own signature storybook style. But I was excited because I was thinking and hoping that maybe the writers were beginning to sow the seeds of a backpedal on that whole debacle. Hashtag justice for Jean. However, the way all those scenes were worded left me very uneasy. The concept of challenging or defying one's fate has become an extremely common trope in games lately. It's practically a cliché, and yet despite how commonplace it is, or how much it would fit her character, Jeanne does not one time actually talk about defying her fated death. All the language from both her and the narrator revolves around accepting fate, rather than fearing it. Not changing fate, just not fearing it. Like, there goes our mulligan. I really hope that I'm misreading the meaning behind those words, or that there is subtle mistranslation from the original Japanese script or something, but it just left yet another worrisome taste in my mouth after positively adoring Bayonetta Origins. To be clear, this is of course nowhere near the level of the previous two bad ending experiences. Cereza and the Lost Demon's main story tells a complete and satisfying tale with a complete and satisfying ending. Jean's tale is a perfect little dessert to cap off the experience and throw a bone to the lorehounds of the mainline titles, but it saddens me that the franchise may be doubling down on its worst decisions even as it provides context to change them. <sighs> I think Kamiya needs an intervention. <laughs>